Okay, we are recording. We are live. Welcome to Steel Design. It is lecture 21. Wow. I think uh, it's fair to say that we are sort of at the halfway point, which is about, we're about where we should be in the class. Um, I mean, granted, we, we had to cut some topics out because of the weather, but we're starting to get to the point where we're making up because mo I cut out uh, one topic uh, related to tension members and one topic related to bolted connections that we would have another lecture for bolted connections after today but today's going to be the last uh, topic related to bolts because we're going to move on to welds after this and then I cut another topic uh, out of welds because I just want to cover the basics of welds uh, and then we'll be caught up we'll be back on track so Okay, um, uh, homework 3.2 is graded. The exam one corrections are still being graded. I uh, haven't gotten to that. Uh, homework 3.3 is due today. Uh, and then homework 3.4 is going to be assigned today. I haven't actually created 3.4, uh, so I might be a little bit late in getting that. Uh, but my goal is to have that. Uh, I want to try and have it uploaded before noon, uh, like in between, because I've got some problems I can go off of. But uh, if I'm a little late, uh, I apologize. I'll, I'll let you know as soon as it's uploaded. Um, what we're going to do today, uh, oh, and one other thing, I, I forgot. I don't know what happened. I thought I had updated the, the Blackboard page with the lecture notes because I try and have them uploaded before each class. And I don't know what happened, but there was a, uh, they were in the directory, but they weren't linked on the page. Uh, I'm not sure, but all the lecture notes up to date are now linked. So you can download everything. I don't know what happened because uh, they were there. I just, I don't know, Blackboard. That's all I can say. Okay, um, let me make this full screen. Um, and let's get to it. So what we're going to do is talk about, um, uh, go back to bolted connections, but we're talking about a particular type of bolted connection. Uh, specifically, we're talking about what's called a slip critical connection. Now, um, I want to back up a bit and just make sure that everybody's clear on the process because what I want to, to illustrate to you uh, is that when we get into slip critical connection, and we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about what a slip critical connection is and how to install a slip critical connection and how to compute the capacity of a slip critical bolt. But when it comes down to it, the process really isn't all that different. Um, in fact, um, when you're designing a slip critical connection versus a bearing type connection, there is one slight adjustment in the step-by-step -step process and by and large, it is the exact same. So. Um, I want to recall just the, the capacity for a bearing type connection. So first off, whenever we have a bearing type connection, there are two limit states, that is bolt shear and bolt bearing. So bolt shear, now one of the things, I want to talk about bolt shear just for a quick sec. Do you remember how we introduced that in class? Like we, we spent a lot of time talking about the math. You know, we said, okay, here's what FNV is if the threads are included. Here's what FNV is if the threads are excluded. Um, here's what it means for single shear versus double shear. And then remember how we had that quick exercise where we demonstrated how you can compute the capacity of a single bolt. And then we said, well, we really don't ever do that because we have this table 7-1. So we don't have to chug through the math because table 7-1 for any permutation of uh, bolt grade or loading condition or thread condition or bolt diameter, it's all here. Okay, So we're going to have something very similar for, for uh, uh, bolt slip as well, for, for the slip critical capacity of a bolt. Uh, there's a similar uh, design aid. Uh, but we, just like we did with bolt shear, we're going to walk through the math because I think it's very important to understand that you're not just pulling values from a table, but there's a reason why you're, you're pulling those values. Um, now, bolt bearing, that's the one you kind of have to chug through. So uh, per bolt, uh, the capacity is the minimum of 1.2 LCTFU or 2.4 uh, DTFU, D being the diameter of the bolt on that lower expression. Um, the LC, we have a different clear distance for uh, for edge bolts and for interior bolts. And remember when we're computing LC values, we use the physical hole diameter. So we add a 16th of an inch to the diameter of the bolt, not an eighth of an inch. Um, and remember that, you know, here's this image on the bottom, which uh, illustrates what is a, um, let me see if that worked. Yeah, this illustrates what is a, um, uh, a, uh, an edge bolt and what is an interior bolt. Okay. Now, and uh, lastly, don't forget layout requirements. And these are going to be the same for slip critical connections and for bearing type connections as well. I really want to illustrate that the process for designing a connection is no different other than the adjustment of one step. Speaking of, let's go through the step-by-step -step process for designing a bolted connection. So how do you go about designing a bolted connection? And what we did last time is we looked at bearing type connections. So we determined the factored load, and then we determined the shear capacity of a single bolt 
uh, and divided to get the number of bolts. So if you have 200 kips on your connection and each bolt can hold up 20 kips, 200 divided by 20 is 10, and that's how many bolts you're using. Now, it, it never really works out that way because it ends up being, you know, it's not 10 bolts, it's 10.26 bolts, and so you have to round and choose a pattern that makes sense, uh, lay out that pattern according to prescribed requirements, and then you check your bolt bearing capacity, and then you iterate if necessary. I think you found on your homework that you needed to iterate once because if you use the minimum spacings, uh, it didn't quite work. That process is no different for a slip critical connection. The only thing that changes, and it changes very slightly, is step two. Because what we do for a bearing type connection is we look up the shear capacity for a bolt. For, the, for slip critical connections, we're going to take the shear capacity per bolt and the slip capacity per bolt, and we're just going to take the minimum of those two. Uh, other than that, everything else changes. So what we need to talk about is the slip critical capacity of a bolt. Um, but before we do that, we kind of need to talk about what a slip critical connection even is. How does it differ from a bearing type connection? Um, what's this deal with pretensioning? How do we pretension uh, uh, bolts? And there's a variety of methods that we can use to do that. Uh, and then how do we compute the capacity of a slip critical bolt? Before I get into that though, are there any questions about uh, what I've talked about so far? Everybody good? Um, everybody good on, on the material so far? I'm gonna wait on that one. I want everybody to be uh, wide awake this Monday morning. Good deal. All right, so let's talk about slip critical connections. So. Um, I want to start by going back to this image here. Uh, this image I showed you earlier in, in the uh, in the semester, a few lectures ago, and I was looking at the uh, force resistant mechanisms for a given uh, bolt installation. And uh, if you remember, there's basically three different resisting forces that can happen in a bolted connection. So we have the bolt physically, you know, maybe bearing on the plate, you know, something like that. Um, we have the shear inside the um, the shear inside the bolt, but then there was this friction that we talked about. And the difference between a bearing connection, a bearing type connection and a slip critical connection is that in a bearing type connection, we assume that the uh, the bolt resists the load by coming into physical contact with the plate, okay? Um, so you have your bolt, you have the plate, and it's physically coming into contact. And that's fine for regular old everyday connections. Um, the problem is uh, whenever connections are going to be subjected to fatigue. Okay, Now, every single person on this call has probably fatigued a metal to failure in their life. And the easiest example of that is a soda can talking about the, the lid on the soda can. If I had a soda can or a can of Coca-Cola or Mountain Dew or something like that, um, how would I get that tab easily off the can? Like, how do you do that? How, what's an easy way to rip that tab off? Well, you could twist it. That's one way of doing it. What's another way of doing it? it it's an, and and the, the kicker is easy way. Rock it back and forth. There you go. So you take it, you bend it, you bend it, you bend it, you bend it. And then what happens after doing that a few times? Well, it starts to get like soft, like the metal feels like it's getting soft and it starts to get weaker. Then after a while, it just boop, pops right off. Okay. What you're doing in that scenario is you're exposing the metal to a load uh, cycle phenomenon called fatigue. Okay. By, by putting it under what we call stress reversal, you know, you're loading it and unloading it, loading it, unloading it you're introducing cracks, like micro cracks into the metal. And after a while, those cracks start to grow and it fails. And that is a, a especially concerning in situations with cyclic loading because as you take that soda can tab and you pop it back and forth, it starts to weaken and it fails under a stress much lower than its original uncracked capacity, its raw metal capacity or yield strength or, or whatever, depending upon the metal that we're looking at. So under fatigue, you can fail at stresses far lower than the yield stress and whatnot. And so as engineers, if you ever have a scenario where fatigue is an issue, you really got to pay attention to those details. And so when in civil engineering do we ever have structures that are subjected to repeated cycles of loading? Bridges, okay? So whenever you're looking at bolted connections in bridges, they 
by and large are always slip critical connections because under that loading and unloading scenario, one of the things that we always pay attention to are the fabrication details, you know, where a plate intersects with a flange or wherever there's a bolt hole or wherever there's a, a, a weld, any of those fabrication details, that's what the structural engineer pays attention to when they're looking at fatigue. And having a bolt come into contact with that plate I mean, think about think about the cycles of loading. We design highway bridges in the United States for a 75-year design life currently. So 75 years, 365 days a year, and let's say a bridge experiences 2,000 vehicles a day. Do the math, that's a lot of cycles of load. That's millions of cycles of repeated load over the design life. And if that bolt is rubbing inside the, uh, you know, inside the bolt hole in connection with that plate, that, that constant uh, cyclic loading can really cause some issues uh, in the uh, in the long-term performance of that connection. So what we do is we try and ensure that that bearing doesn't happen. Well, how do you ensure that the bolt does not come into contact with the plate? Well, you stick that bolt through and you wrench the heck out of it. You put so much tension on that that the bolt isn't going to slip, <laughs> hence the term slip critical, okay? So we mash the, uh, we, basically what's happening is we take those two plates, we tighten the bolt to where it comes into contact, and then we pre-tension it, okay? So to install a slip critical bolt, first thing we have to do is we have to get the bolts snug tight. Now, one of the common questions I always get, well, what does snug tight mean? So snug tight is usually the tightness that gets attained from like a few hits of an impact wrench or usually like the full effort of an iron worker. But in short, if you want a definition for what snug tight really means, it's the condition where the two plates or the two contact surfaces firmly bear upon one another and, and the, the bolts are engaged. That, that's snug tight. Um, once you get the plates snug tight, that's just that's just them in contact bearing with one another. That's not applying a significant amount of force between them in order to generate that necessary normal force uh, for, for a resisting friction. So once you get it snug tight, you have to use a prescribed method to achieve the required torque, to achieve the required tension inside the bolt. And I'm going to talk about a few of those methods that we can use and do use in the real world to achieve that uh, pretension. But before I move on, everybody good so far? Any questions? Again, don't hesitate if you got any questions. All right, I'm gonna take that as good, okay. So let's talk about some of these methods. So um, there are a series of methods that you can use to achieve uh, the specified pretension in a bolt. And first off, I guess I should explain that I'm using this term pretension. Okay. So what I mean by that is this. So if I have plate A and plate B, and I'm, you know, sticking a bolt through them and tightening the bolt, the plates are sandwiching together. Okay. But what do you think is happening to the bolt inside as I tighten the bolt? As I tighten that bolt between those two uh, plates, the more I tighten that bolt, it's almost like the bolt is experiencing a tension. It's wanting to stretch inside, uh, inside the, the, the hole. And so what we try and do with these methods is we try and pr uh, put enough torque in, into, the, uh, into the bolt so that we achieve that required amount of tension. So that's what we mean by uh, minimum pretensions because where the bolt is going through the hole, the plates are compressing together, but the bolt is experiencing tension. It's kind of like what happens in pre-stressed concrete. You lock tension inside the cable so that the compression gets locked into the beam. So that's uh, just to give you a little corollary there. Okay, so what are some of these methods that we can use to achieve this? So one of them is called the turn of the nut method. And so if anybody has ever been, uh, had a DOH internship and you were ever on a job where there were any bolted connections getting installed, you might have seen something like this on the connections, these little chalk marks that were marked on the, uh, on the bolted connection. And so basically what you do is you uh, mark the bolt, the nut, and the plate with these chalk lines, these, uh, m these match marks. And the idea is that once you get it to snug tight, you mark it, and then you turn it a specified amount in order to achieve that, that pretension. Now, how much do you turn it? You can find that in the manual. It's on page 16.2-54 if you're interested. Now, that, that's not a typo because up until now we've been looking at 16.1-whatever. 
16.2 actually refers to a whole nother specification uh, in the manual. I'm a, man, I have left my phone on. My apologies. I'm going to turn that down. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, remember how I said that the back of the manual contains the specification? Well, I kind of lied when I said that there's one specification back there. There's actually three specifications back there. Uh, but the other two don't really affect us a whole lot as designers, um, or at least uh, as you know, as engineering students in an in introductory structural steel design course. Um, the first one, the one that we've been operating in, you know, the chapter D, chapter E, you know, chapter J, all that stuff. That is the the main AISC 360 specification. Um, but if you turn past the gray pages, past these uh, pages with the gray lining, here I'll turn my webcam on so that you can kind of see this but if you turn past the gray pages there's actually two specification documents that are past this one of them is related to structural connections and um, a lot of that material uh, a lot of that material uh, is, is repeated in AISC 360 which is why we really don't need to focus on it too much but some of it is is uh, supplementary uh, so, for instance, uh, you know, a lot of the equations for bolt shear and bolt bearing, they're the same equations back there, but it also uh, uh, contains information about how to properly fabricate things or how to properly install bolted connections. And so if you go to 16.2-54, it'll tell you, okay, if your bolt is this long, you know, you need to turn a third of a turn past snug tight or a half a turn past snug tight or, or whatever. Um, and so if you're ever interested, you, you ought to uh, leaf through 16.2. It's, it, uh, it's an RCSC specification, which stands for the Research Council on Structural Connections, and just has a bit more info on, um, on uh, bolted connections. But uh, uh, again, a lot of this is complementary to the spec. It's not you know, anything different or anything new. And in case you're wondering, 16.3 is the code of standard practice for steel building. So if you're ever interested in that, but that's very contractual it's like contract documents and tolerances and things like that very on the fabricator side of things uh, as opposed to the engineer not to say that you shouldn't learn about it but it's much more on the professional practice side of things um, okay now that's method number one what about method number two let me go to here so method number two oh I hit my my be right back uh, message on OSB or OBS there we go okay so what about method number two? Method number two is to use just a calibrated wrench. So the idea is that, you know, I could use a calibrated wrench to achieve that pretension, but the, the wrench is just that it has to be calibrated. So a common uh, device is just to use an impact wrench. But uh, what you have to do with a calibrated wrench is you have to calibrate that device daily on the site. And so typically if you're ever on a steel uh, uh, fabrication site where they're installing bolted connections this way, you'll see one of these things over here on the right. Um, this is a, a tension calibration device. One of the very common brands is a Skidmore Wilhelm. In fact, if you just Google Skidmore Wilhelm, the, you know, you'll see images of all these things. Basically, what this is is a super duper hyper accurate bathroom scale. The idea is that you stick a bolt, a bolt installation through that, that hole in the middle and using your wrench, you would tighten it and that device would tell you if your device is calibrated to achieve the uh, appropriate pretension. And you gotta do that daily on the site. So every morning you gotta do it, recalibrate it to, to, to start installing. So, um, you know, impact wrenches, if you've ever used an impact wrench, it's they're very quick to use, they're very convenient, but you know, in, in order to meet the spec, you gotta, you gotta do this as well. All right, a couple of the other uh, nifty methods out there, one of them is called a twist off control bolt. So we had talked about this uh, a little earlier. So this is uh, basically a, a special wrench and a special bolt. So the bolt meets all of the material specifications of an A325 or an A490 or, or, or whatever uh, bolt you're looking at. But it, it obviously doesn't look like a, a, a regular structural bolt. For one, there's not a hexagonal uh, uh, top to the bolt, it's just rounded because the way that it works is you have a special wrench that grips both the, the bolt and the nut at the same time. One of the chucks spins the tip of the bolt, the other spins the nut in the opposite direction, tightening the bolt. And once you achieve that desired pretension, the, the shear or the little tip shears off. So if you're an inspector, 
um, it, it, it's really easy because all you have to do is look at the bolts and as long as the bolts, uh, as long as those splined ends have chucked off, you know that the bolt meets the pretension. They're also really fast and really easy to install because you don't need wrenches on either end. You can just grab, uh, put the bolt through and tighten everything all from one end. They are a little bit more expensive, but you get the convenience and the, the, the speed with that, that price. So it's always you know, a little bit of a trade-off. Um, and the fourth method uh, that's used is what's called a direct tension indicator or a DTI. Uh, a DTI, most common DTIs are just washers. Um, these washers have these little protrusions, these little nubs that stick out. And the idea is that you um, install your bolt and then you start tensioning the bolt. And what happens is right here, I don't know if you can see that on the air, but those little nubs start to flatten. And once that gap reaches a desired value, then you know that you've achieved your specified pretension. And you can check that in the field. They have these uh, what are called feeler gauges. And so as long as you know you, you, know, you can uh, uh, measure that gap, you can see whether or not your bolt has achieved the specified pretension. So there's, there's you know, these are you know, arguably the four most common methods of achieving pretension in a slip critical bolt. It's not like I'd ever ask you to uh, remember those for an exam or anything. Um, but uh, the other thing I'd mention about DTIs is, uh, you know, in this one, there's a, uh, you know, there's actually a metal protrusion that, you know, once it flattens, you know that you, you've met your pretension. Sometimes there, there are actually, there, there are DTIs, they're, they're kind of nifty. There, there are DTIs that have these little nubs, but instead of it just being metal, they're kind of filled with this like orange goop uh, that's the best way of describing it. Uh, it kind of looks like like Play-Doh almost. Um, and so what happens is you start uh, tightening the, uh, the, the connection and once you hit the specified pretension, the goop sort of squirts out of the, the in between the washer and the, uh, in, you know in between the washer. And so when you start to see orange goop, it's like, okay, you know you've hit your pretension. So um, all there's all sorts of, of ways that, that uh, we as engineers can meet that specified pretension, but the important thing is, um, is or the important two things, I guess you could say, is one, these uh, methods are all intended to ensure that you meet that minimum pretension that you've got to meet in order to call it a slip critical connection, and two, there are multiple methods. Which one do you use? It's a function of economy. You know what you're doing how many bolts you're installing, and what's the price at the end of the day, I think would be the uh, uh, the best way of going about it. Okay, any questions before we start talking about the math and start talking about capacity? Okay, so what we're talking about here is, hold on, I'm curious if my audio here is, I don't know, I'm, barely hearing anything. Let me see something. Can somebody in class say something? I don't know if anybody said anything because I, I can't. I don't know. If... Okay, I hear that now. I hear that now. Okay. Something. <laughs> thank you. I don't know if it was my Bluetooth, but sometimes my, my earbuds show up as different. Like it's not one device. There's like three or whatnot that show up on my list. And sometimes my, my desktop has a way of just switching the device. I don't know. I really like these earbuds though, so I, I don't want to switch. Okay, so let's talk about the capacity of a slip critical bolt. Now, ultimately what we're talking about here is friction, okay? And so if we go back to uh, statics or physics, you know, how do you determine if I have a object resting on a surface and I yank on that object like this, how do I determine the amount of force that is going to resist that motion due to friction. And so it's a function of two things. It's a function of the normal force and then this coefficient of static friction, right? And so the normal force is just how much force is between those two surfaces. And then this coefficient of static friction is a function of the surface characteristics. So, you know, like wood on aluminum or copper on steel or whatever. In this case, we're talking about steel on steel connection or contact, but it's a function of the condition of those surfaces. So we'll have names for that uh, as well. So uh, the equation that's in the spec is the same. It's, it's formatted the same way. It's basically the coefficient of static friction times a normal force, but then there's some adjustment factors that, that go on the end of the day. So in other words, 
This is my coefficient of static friction, you know, mu value. This term TB, this is that bolt pretension, which that bolt pretension is just that. It's the normal force. Maybe I'll use a, a highlighter here. So this is my coefficient of friction. This is my normal force, okay? The other terms are basically just multipliers that adjust that, and we'll talk about what each of those mean. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that this is the first, and, and I believe one of only two times the entire semester, where phi is one, okay? Um, main reason why is because um, if a bolt fails and slip, it doesn't mean that the connection is going to fail because you do still have bolt shear and bolt bearing to go along with that. And also, bolt or slip critical connections tend to have a lot more bolts than bearing type connections anyway. So not only do you have those other limit states to rely on, you tend to have a lot more capacity uh, as well. So you don't need to get crazy with your, your fee values on this. That's why we can use a, a fee of one. But let's digest these. Uh, what, what are each of these terms and, and you know, what do they represent? So here's our expression. So we've got, um, you know, we've got a number of terms here. So we've got mu, we've got du, we've got hf, tb, ns, so on and so forth. So let's take them one at a time. First off, the resistance factor. The resistance factor is one, okay? Uh, the resistance factor is one, so you don't have to worry about forgetting to multiply by phi because it's one. Uh, Rn is the nominal slip resistance per bolt measured, you know, in kips, okay? And so ultimately what you're doing is you're taking your mean slip coefficient, um, mean slip coefficient right here, multiplying it by the minimum fastener pretension, uh, and then adjusting it. So those what those two values are. What about the rest? So we know what phi is. We know what Rn is. So what about the rest? Let's talk about du because du is kind of interesting. Du is just 1.13. Uh, and it's kind of strange because you would think that du would be like there'd be some formula or some well if this is the case then it's this value or if this is the case then it's this value because up until now we it's been kind of like we haven't really had that you know like for bolt shear well if it was whether threads are included or threads are excluded you know values change no du is just 1.13 okay so what's the deal with the du DU is a multiplier, and what it uh, accounts for is the ratio between the mean installed bolt pretension versus the specified minimum pretension. So here, here's in a nutshell what I'm talking about. Okay, all of those methods that I mentioned earlier, the twist off control bolts, the direct tension indicators, all that stuff, those methods are all designed in order to achieve a specified minimum pretension value in the spec. Okay. But here's the truth of it. If you look at the spec, the spec says, okay, I have a bolt. The bolt has to have 25 kips in pretension. In reality, you end up getting much more than that. If you do the math or go down to the lab and test all these connections, all those methods that I'm talking about, they achieve that pretension and in fact, a lot more. Um, in fact, on average, they achieve about 13% more capacity. So DU is 1.13, okay? Uh, it is a multiplier that reflects the mean installed bolt pretension to the specified minimum, what you get in the field versus what you're specifying. Now, you can change that value if you want as long as it's approved by the EOR. Does anybody on this call know what e EOR stands for? I am curious. I think I, I can think of one that will probably know what this is. Anybody know what this is? I do because I've seen it before. But I'm sure. Yeah, I knew. I knew you had. Yeah, engineer of record. I know I drew the C, but it sort of went away from me. Yeah, the engineer of record. So um, the engineer of record can change that uh, if they would like. Um, so if you know, you know that you know. If you're, let's say, you know, you work with this particular fabrication method all the time and particular uh, devices, particular companies, and you know that they get a different value, you could change that if you want. Um, I don't think it's really changed all that much in practical applications, but it, it, you know, it, it can be changed as long as it's approved by the EOR. Engineer of record, factoid for, um, for future use. Okay, um, lastly, there are a couple of other uh, parameters. So number one, there's the number of, uh, slip planes, and the number of slip planes is kind of like the number of shear planes. 
Yes. Uh, so, Mr. Shmir Jensen, yes, is that uh, uh, someone with a PE? Most likely, yes. The uh, the the PE. I would say the PE who's stamping the drawings. You know, so if it's going to be your stamp on the drawings, who's going to be approving those designs? You're the one who's accepting that liability. Then yes, that that, that would be you. Um, uh, Ninety nine percent of the time, yeah. So he. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I beat you to it this time. Usually you beat me to it, but I beat you to it this time. <laughs> um, so uh, NS is the number of slip planes. M more often than not, the number of slip planes is just the number of shear planes. That can change if you have filler plates in the connection. And H sub F is this factor for filler, filler plates. But I'm going to talk about what filler plates are uh, here in a second. Um, let me talk about some of these other factors so that you're aware. So first off, the mean slip coefficient. I think we understand what it is, but I wanted to make sure everybody was clear on what the actual values were for a given condition. So if you go to chapter J of the spec, and this is on page 16.1-135, so the equation's on page 134, and this is on the next page, I think up the top part of the page. Um, this is where the mean slip coefficients are defined. and so. The way that we handle this in the spec is we either have class A or class B fang surfaces. This has changed from spec to spec. Sometimes I think uh, the previous spec we had class A, B, and C. Um, and also I think you can find different definitions in the bridge spec versus the building spec. That can change a little bit depending upon the conditions. But for the steel manual, there's only two. It's either 0.3 or 0.5. Class A is for just basically regular old steel. Um, uh, but class B is basically for blast clean steel. Um, that's, uh, you know, whether it's been sandblasted or not is really the, the, the main uh, uh, delimiter there. But more often than not, people are just going and assuming class A surfaces. I, I'm not sure of a, a hyper amount of instances where folks are blast cleaning for this. Not saying it doesn't happen. Of course it happens. I just, I don't think it's in the majority. Most people are just going with class A fang surfaces. And so for class A fang surfaces, we use a um, mu value of 0.3. And when I say fang surface, fang surface, F-A-Y-I-N-G, that's just that contact surface uh, between the two plates. The bolt pretension, you can find that in table J3.1. So just so everybody's aware, I hope that you all are following along with me in the manual. This is on 16.1-127. Like I said, we're going to be spending a fair amount of time in Chapter J, so you ought to try and turn the pages with me on this because I want to, uh, I want to uh, follow along with this. So this is on 16.1-127. These are the bolt pretensions. This is the TB values for the bolts. And so whether you're in Group A, Group B, or Group C, we very rarely use uh, Group C, but let's say Group A or Group B. Uh, based on your uh, bolt diameter, you can look up what is the uh, bolt pretension in KIPP. So if it's a, a half inch diameter group A bolt, uh, the pretension is 12 KIPPs. So that's how much force you can assume applied normally to the plate right there. That's the, that's the pretension locked in, inside the bolt. And so that's the TB value that we would then adjust uh, accordingly. Okay. Lastly, I, I think this is last. Yeah, this is last. So the last thing I want to talk about is filler plates. So a filler plate gets used uh, sometimes in spliced connections. So um, we've seen spliced connections before in, uh, in, in this class, uh, but up until now we've been splicing two members that were the same size. So we'd had you know, like a half inch plate spliced to a half inch plate. And so we'd put a plate on top, plate on the bottom and just bolt it. Well, what if you're splicing two sections that aren't the same size? So for instance, uh, what if, you know, what if this, let's put some numbers on here. What if this flange is three quarters of an inch thick and this flange is one inch thick, okay? Well, if that's the case, if I put these plates together, you're going to see that they don't line up, that the, the flange on the left is a little too thin. And so what we might do is put a quarter inch fill plate in between so that when I slap those splice plates on the top and bottom that it, they lay flat. And so that's what a fill plate is. Um, sometimes if the dimensions are really wonky, like what if this is, you know, I'm, please don't quote me on the math or anything because I'm just making these numbers up. What if this is 1930 seconds of an inch and this is, you know, one and a quarter inch? 
you know, because those dimensions are very wonky, we may not be able to get a flat um, uh, 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 splice connection without one fill plate. We might need two. Like we might need like a, a half inch and then like a three thirty seconds or something. I, I don't know. We might need some fill plates that are some, some odd dimensions to get that to stack up. Whenever you have two or more filler plates, we use an HF value of 0.85, but most often when either we have no fillers or one filler, we just use an HF of one. So there's only some very rare instances where we would even need to consider that. And, and for what we do in this class, HF is, is going to be one. This also can change the number of slip planes because if you got a bunch of filler plates in between, that's more surfaces in contact. And so that changes the, the number of slip planes uh, uh, between, the, um, uh, be between the, the connection. Okay, does this make sense? Any questions before we do a very quick exercise? While we're doing this, um, I'll go ahead and write the capacity expression. So phi Rn is phi times uh, mu du. Let me see. Oh, I know the terms. I just want to make sure I get them in the right order. I don't know that that really matters, but all right. So here's the the capacity of a single bolt. And let's see if we can compute the capacity of a single bolt according to the spec. And so I'm going to borrow on you to help me out with the math. Okay. So let's see if y'all been paying attention. So what is the design slip resistance of a uh, three quarter inch diameter A325 bolt, assuming class A fang surfaces and only one slip plane? No filler plates present. So we've got phi mu du HF, TB, and NS. So let's see if we can determine these values. So somebody in the chat, what's phi? I want to make sure y'all been paying attention. One. All right. Now for those of you that answered, you're off the hook because somebody else gets to answer the next question. What's DU? Nope, you're close. It's not 1.3. Ah, Courtney got it, 1.13. There we go. All right, so next off, what about um, the number of, well, I, I, already, I told you this one, so you, you kind of get off, off the hook there. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and give you this one because there's no filler plates present. So I'm kind of telling you based off this statement and this statement that H sub F is one and N sub S is one. That one's kind of cheating. Okay, so let's take this one. Let's take mu. What is mu for this going to be? Now you got to start flipping through your notes. Not only do you got to start flipping through your notes, hopefully you're flipping through the manual. This one's on page 16.1-135. And I'll help you out on this one. This one's on page 16.1-127. Let me ask you this, because everybody's quiet in the chat. I want you to help me out with this. So what piece of information is in this problem statement is most important for determining the mu value? Okay, Mr. Enoch got it. Yeah, it's 0 0.3. And the reason that matters is it's class. This is a class A fang surface. Okay, so this is 0 0.3. And Mr. Blizzard beat me to it. The TB is 28 kips. So just to make sure everybody's following along with me, I'm going to skip back a couple slides. So the minimum bolt pretension, this was a group A 3 quarter inch diameter bolt. So Mr. Blizzard got that value right there in 16.1-127. And, and for the uh, uh, mean slip coefficients, this was class A. So class A 
mu was 0 0.3. So with that, we've got everything we need. Therefore, phi Rn, we just multiply all these. So I mean, help me out. What is that times that times that times that times that times that? I don't think it likes the fact that the pen's so low. So what do we got? Everybody's quiet today. Nine point five. Yeah, I got. I, I'm gonna round it a little bit further. I got like nine point four nine. Is that what, sub, it, it, there, yeah. Boom. Okay. Now, I want to show you something. All right. I want everybody to follow along with me. Okay, so, everybody remember table 7-1? This is the table that lists the shear capacity per volt. I want everybody to turn to table 7-1. This is the shear capacity. And then I want you to turn the page and I want you to look at table 7-3 and table 7-3 should look something like uh, whoop, like this. So this is table 7-3. This is on uh, page 7-24 and this is the bolt slip capacity per bolt. So table 7-1 is the shear capacity. Table 7-3 is the slip capacity. Now this table is a little bigger um, because there's there's actually three tables. There's the page on the left is group A bolts. The page on the right is group B bolts. Okay. Now, just like table seven one, it's organized by bolt diameter. Um, we also have single. It's not single shear or double shear. It's single slip or double slip. So exactly. But it, this is why I'm getting at. It's like you can look it up, but I want to make sure you understand what values you're pulling. So first off, if we have a standard hole in single slip, three quarter inch diameter bolt, notice how it tells you what the bolt pretension is right there, makes your life a little easier, but also what matters, 9.49 kips per bolt, okay? So it tells you everything that you need right there. Now we're only using the blue numbers, not the green ones, because we're using LRFD in here. So make sure that you're clear on that. So we use uh, 9.49 and we get it right there. Now what's going on over here on the uh, left? So it's about whether or not we're dealing with a standard hole, an oversized hole, or a slotted hole. Um, and where it's, um, uh, uh, this SSLT and SSLP, it's whether we have a short slotted or uh, long slotted, that's the LSL, so short slotted loaded transverse or short slotted loaded parallel. Uh, it, it's just the loading uh, uh, direction. But it doesn't really matter for us because we're more often than not going to be wearing with standard size holes anyway. So we just go uh, with the first row uh, and then single slip, so on and so forth. Okay, any questions? Does this make sense? And one final thing, all this table 7-3 is for class A fang surfaces. So if you've got a class B fang surface, these values are not going to work. You have to multiply them by 1.67. Why 1.67? Well, if you go to this, you know, what's 0 0.5 over 0 0.3? 1.67. That, that's all that is. It's just adjusting the values in the table for class B as opposed to class A. So. Real quick, um, we have a design example here. We're going to go through this real quick. Ooh, I didn't, I didn't do my subscripts there on the on the dead load and live load. I'm going to have to fix that. So we have a lap connection that's subjected to a de uh, dead load of 65 kips and a live load of 115 kips. Uh, we're going to use Group B three quarter inch diameter bolts. Um, wait, what was that? I so. The, 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 the left page of table 7-3 is for group A bolts, and the right page is for group B, right? 
So this right here, this is for group A and this is for group B. Did that, did that answer? I, I feel, okay. All right, so uh, let's design this connection. Now we're not gonna finish this problem, but I think, and I'm probably gonna, I don't wanna say rush through the calculations, but a lot of this is gonna be pretty, um, pretty simple. So uh, let me stop this share. Come on. Okay, so here's the, the problem. Let's see if we can chug through some of this. So first off, step one is to factor the load. So PU is 1.2 times 65 kips plus 1.6 times 115 kips, which is, let's see if I can factor this. Somebody check and see if I'm if I'm making any errors. So I've got two sixty two. Anybody else get that? Okay, good. All right. So now, instead of just the bolt shear capacity, let's look up the bolt shear and the bolt slip capacity. So from table 7-1 and table 7-3. So let's start off with table 7-1. So we have group B, 3 quarter inch diameter bolts. What about the threads? Are they included or excluded? Included, because you weren't told, and whenever you're not told, always assume included. Single shear or double shear? Single. So what are we getting for a capacity? What's VRN? There we go, 22.5. Kit per bolt. That's exactly right. Now let's look at table 7-3. So table 7-3, uh, we have 3 quarter inch diameter group B bolts and single slip. What are we getting for a capacity here? 11.9. And again, that comes from the page on the right. 11.9. And in design land, which one should I use if I'm designing the connection? Use the lower one, which in this case is slip. So, so step three. So I'm getting 22.01 volts, right? Now, you might be able to come up with a pattern that uses 22, but that seems like a really odd pattern to me. So probably what I would do is do 24, because four times six, I get a nice little grid. So try 24 volts. And Here's the thing. I can continue the example that you would like, if you would like, but at this point, there is no difference. I look up the S min and the LE min and I lay out the connection. I then um, go to bolt bearing computations and if I need to iterate, I, I do that as necessary, but nothing else changes. The only thing that changes in a bolt slip connection design is this part right here. 
because instead of just looking up the shear capacity, I look at the shear capacity and the slip capacity. More often than not, the slip capacity is lower, um, but that can change, you know, if you've got filler plates or, you know, depending upon thread conditions and whatnot. So, it, you know, thread conditions don't really affect the slip capacity, but of course that can affect the shear capacity. So that, that can change a little bit, but by and large, like an old rule of thumb is that if you take a, a bearing type connection and convert it to a slip critical connection, usually you need about twice as many volts. And you can see that just from that highlighted portion because 22.5 versus 11.9, that's about, you know, double the capacity or half the capacity, whichever way you look at it. Any questions? Does this make sense? Yeah, you know, I was hoping that, that usually connection land isn't too difficult. Uh, uh, it's one of the easier topics. If, it, if anything, I think the topic we're about to do next, which is welded connections, I think it's even easier. So uh, but just like with bolted connections, there's a lot of background. Like you have to understand the different types of welds, and different joints, and you know what's a fillet weld, what's a plug weld, and all that. Um, but the concept really isn't that difficult. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I'll get this uploaded. Um, and like I said, give me a little bit of time on your homework assignment. I hope to have that done. Um, yeah, uh, well, if you want to get Excel happy, just wait. I got, we got some stuff we could do in Excel. You, you'll you, just wait. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, I will let you know on Teams when I get that homework posted. I hope to get it posted here in the next few minutes, but I'll keep you posted. Uh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. I, I honestly think it's kind of nifty. So don't worry. I, don't, I mean, we could get crazy with Excel, but we don't. Don't worry. All right. That's all I've got, everybody. I will see you all on Wednesday. Y'all have the uh, a good start to your week, and we'll see you then.